Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us again. Um, part of our webinar series where you get to hear about Ofsted from Ofsted. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lee Austin. I'm one of His Majesty's inspectors, but I'm also the deputy director for schools and early education. But if you've uh, tuned into one of our webinars before, then I should be a familiar face and a familiar voice to you. And yeah, absolutely. Thank you. At the end of no doubt another busy day. Thank you for for dialing in. Um, Tonight we have a spotlight firmly on safeguarding. We know it's something that um, lots of you were, were keen and interested to hear from us about. So that's the emphasis of tonight. Although you may have heard a few little snippets, a few little teasers, if you dialed into our back to school webinar um, earlier in the earlier in the autumn term. But we are going to go into far more detail um, tonight, including some scenarios, because we recognised that it would be helpful to bring our school inspection handbook to life and give you some kind of proposed scenarios of what the types of things that we might find in school to give you an idea of kind of what we do um, and the judgments that we that we make. But I'm not alone, as usual. Here's the here's the team for uh, this webinar. Um, if I just hand over to Anna to introduce herself. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Anna Trithiwi and I'm Deputy Director for Cross Rema Education at Ofsted. Jonathan? Hi everyone, uh, good to see you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kay. I'm a Senior HMI in the Schools and Early Education Policy Team and hi to Claire. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Claire Jones and I'm a Specialist Advisor in the Schools Policy, Quality and Training Team. So you'll be hearing from all of us at various points throughout the webinar. Now I think we've had the earliest question ever. It's the, it's the first question we always get asked, which is, can we have the slides? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we'll make the slides available as, as soon as we possibly can. And of course, there's always other means of staying in touch with Ofsted about Ofsted. We have blogs, press releases from time to time, and you can see the links on the screen there. So before we get going, just to say um, we will be turning our videos off in a moment so you can get the full screen of the slides. You'll hear our voices, but you won't see us. And of course, at the end, we have an opportunity for um, Q&A. And thank you to everybody that sent questions in in advance. So while we just turn our cameras off, um, our aim, as I said, over the next um, next 60 minutes or so, is to give you an over overview of what we do specifically around inspecting safeguarding. And we'll include the updates that we've made this term, particularly around adding clarity and hopefully lots of reassurance about what we do and what we consider when we look at safeguarding in schools. And above all, this is all about providing you with the reassurance that you need because we know safeguarding is a complex area it involves multiple people it extends beyond the school to other agencies so we want to reassure you about the part that you within school play but of course what extends beyond school and therefore what we we don't necessarily hold you you to account for it goes without saying though that safeguarding is at the heart of every school and it's also part of Ofsted's core business and our judgments about the effectiveness of safeguarding are always carefully considered but as I said it is a complex judgment and we always try and balance up a broad range of relevant evidence and you'll see in the scenarios later how we kind of um, weigh up I suppose the evidence and piece that jigsaw together so that no one single piece of the jigsaw would necessarily overrule the bigger picture that we create. Um, we know that lots of people can be anxious about this particularly because of the implications that an ineffective judgment can have so again, some reassurance right from the start that we will always carry out our work sensitively and proportionately. So um, to reassure you, there isn't any brand new messages around safeguarding. So although we've updated our handbook for September, it was about reducing some of the repetition. It was about pulling information together from different documents. So hopefully it's now all in one place in terms of inspection within our school inspection handbook. But broadly, it's the same as, as we've always um, had and we've always been doing. And that's because we inspect against legislation, the legislation of what schools are required to do to keep children safe. And I'm sure you're all well aware that that's defined by keeping children safe in education, which is a Department for Education document. Nevertheless, we have updated our handbook. We've worked with union leaders, sector representatives, Department for Education. I myself and others in my team have been out and about listening to you um, and your colleagues on the ground and that has helped us craft the updates and the clarifications that not only have we put in our handbook but we've also been delivering um, updated training to our inspectors. 
and that's where I want to start on the on the next slide. It's with a it's actually exactly the same slide we used for our ex inspector training back in um, the beginning of September. Um, and we, we introduced it just at the start of a whole morning of training around safeguarding. So in the next few slides, um, you'll hear about the importance of safeguarding. And obviously we'll, we'll consider how we inspect the work that you do to keep children safe. Um, it's only part, let's, let's remember, it's only part of the work we do on inspection. And we said at the start that safeguarding is you know, obviously part of our core business, but schools are much more than that, you know, much more complex. And it's about delivering the best possible education. And schools are complex organisations. And we know in going about our work, we always have to balance the challenges that safeguarding or potential safeguarding issues can raise on a day to day basis. What have we boiled that down to? Well, put simply, we're recognising and we're sharing that with our inspector workforce and with you um, on this webinar schools cannot be everything to everyone and we've asked inspectors to make sure that that thinking is prominent in their mind the pressures the demands that you all face are considerable and wide in scope and we understand that and you know you not only have had to deal with the pandemic the continued impact of lockdowns gaps in learning we know there's now um, absenteeism and, 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 and att attendance issues and of course, also having to manage the pressures and demands of an economic crisis as well. And for some more recently, the risk and disruption that we know RAC um, has brought. So we know there's a lot that people have to contend with, but of course we will always be proportionate and we will be reasonable in terms of understanding that schools cannot be everything to everyone, but we will want to get underneath you know, whether leaders have done all that they can reasonably do in the time and the circumstances in which they work because context is key and while we want to be assured that pupils are kept safe from harm and they get the support that they might need we've got to be realistic because for example school leaders are not trained social workers and we know there are other demands within the system in which schools have to work that aren't the responsibility of school leaders that being said we would expect schools to do all they reasonably can to ensure that the children that they work with that they have under their care are absolutely safe because they are fulfilling their statutory duties. So just a quick outline of the, of the rest of the session. So we've already started to unpick how we inspect safeguarding. We want to start with an updated definition of effective safeguarding, which includes the phrase an open and positive culture. And we'll give you a little bit more detail about that. And of course, also what might constitute serious and widespread failures. We'll also talk a little more about our early monitoring inspections. So that's those early monitoring inspections where we plan to return more quickly, specifically to schools that are judged inadequate only because of ineffective safeguarding. And I just want to reassure you that's an exceptionally small proportion of schools. We'll come on, on to more about that later. And of course, also defining some of the terms around minor improvements. What does that mean? And as I said at the start, trying to unpick that by giving you some example scenarios to bring our school inspection handbook and methodology to life. So let's start at a high level and how we inspect safeguarding. And as we've said to begin with, we want to reassure you that these messages have all been shared with inspectors too. And of course, many of our inspectors are of course serving school leaders themselves. So I want to start by reiterating the point that we've made about proportionality. And we know that school leaders as I've said, can't be everything to everyone. And we know that schools work to local guidance, local thresholds, they have to make referrals in specific timeframes and parameters. But if schools are fulfilling those expectations and they're creating an effective safeguarding culture in their school, then inspectors will of course judge that favorably. It's not, and this goes across all of our work, not just safeguarding, it's not about trying to catch anyone out when it comes to inspection, because it's all about collective responsibility to protect pupils from serious harm. And we'll work with you on inspection to understand exactly how you're dealing with the issues faced in your school. Because inspection is essentially a series of conversations. It's a professional dialogue to understand why you do what you do and what difference is it making to the pupils in your school. So at the heart of keeping children safe is a focus on absolutely getting the culture right. Securing a safeguarding culture that is open and positive where people have the necessary training and knowledge to share any concerns that they might have and ensure that pupils and their families 
obviously re receive the, the help and support that they need. And we'll unpick some of those phrases and words a little more as we go through the rest of the slides. But let's just for a minute consider the overall landscape and remind ourselves that for the vast majority of schools, an open and positive safeguarding culture is indeed in place. And for the vast majority of schools, children are safe. And I think this is a really crucial slide just to bring that, um, that point even further into your minds. So this slide shows that the vast majority of schools are getting it right. Very few of our inspections result in a requires improvement or an inadequate judgment. And if we look at safeguarding itself, our data shows that about around 3% of schools are judged um, to have ineffective uh, to have ineffective safeguarding on graded inspections. And if we include ungraded inspections as well, then actually that overall percentage shifts and it's only around 1% of schools that would have ineffective safeguarding. So we are talking about an exceptionally small proportion of schools. And I hope that brings you some reassurance that we do not find safeguarding to be ineffective in, you know, in, in a vast majority of schools that we visit. It is exceptionally rare. But where we do have to say that safeguarding is ineffective, you know, that is a difficult call. And it's, it's because we have revealed serious or widespread failures in a school's safeguarding arrangements. So for example, the school's arrangements might not meet statutory requirements, they might give us serious cause for concern, or it might be that the school has taken insufficient action to rem remedy weaknesses following a serious incident. And obviously that means that pupils are not safe or they are at risk of not being safe. So in other words, the judgment of ineffective safeguarding is only made where we find systemic weaknesses in safeguarding and culture. And it's very rarely that when we do find ineffective safeguarding, that it rests on a single issue. It's normally a much, a much bigger jigsaw and there are multiple pieces of evidence that when we piece it together, would reveal that that culture, that open and positive culture, just isn't in place. So I'm gonna hand over now to Claire, who's just going to give you a little bit more detail about the actual nuts and bolts of what we do. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Lee. Hello, everyone. Um, so over the next few slides, I'm going to talk you through how we inspect the effectiveness of safeguarding in schools. As Lee mentioned earlier, it's the Department for Education that sets the policy and guidance around safeguarding as part of their role as the regulator. As Ofsted, what we do is use the guidance that's been set out by the department in keeping children safe in education as the basis for our work alongside our school inspection handbook. Now, to ensure that inspectors are fully up to date with the latest guidance, we provide annual safeguarding updates for all HMI and Ofsted inspectors in much the same way as you will do with your staff in schools. And in terms of our handbook, you may well have noticed, as Lee mentioned earlier, that we've recently made some updates in relation to safeguarding. So to make things simpler, we've brought all our safeguarding guidance together in one place. You may be aware that we previously had a separate document called Inspecting Safeguarding, and we've now withdrawn that. And the information that was within that document has been incorporated into the inspection handbook to remove any unnecessary duplication. Now, when we inspect safeguarding, our focus is on checking what the culture in a school is like. And to do that, we consider what schools have put in place and whether it's effective in developing that open and positive culture that Lee's just talked about, a culture that puts people's interests first and helps to keep people safe. We don't use a checklist approach to do that. Instead, what we'll do is take account of a wide range of evidence that's gathered through the whole inspection process. And safeguarding really is one of those golden threads that runs through everything we do. Almost all the inspection activities that we do help us to build a picture of the safeguarding culture in a school. And uh, the, the next slide shows some of those activities that we do. Before the inspection gets underway, in that initial call that we have with a school, the lead inspector will explain what documents that they'll need to look at when they're on site. And those documents are also set out in the inspection handbook for you to see ahead of time. Now included in that list of documents is um, a list of any referrals that have been made to the local authority, along with brief details of the resolution. 
Now, those brief details can be drawn from your local records. So, for example, what we'll want to know is what support was provided, who provided it, and if the case is ongoing. When we meet with a designated safeguarding lead, we'll check if there have been any safeguarding incidents or allegations since the previous inspection. And within that, we'll look at whether appropriate action was taken. So we'll sample case files, we'll discuss referrals, and we'll explore how any concerns that do meet those local thresholds are passed on to the local authority. And when you make a referral, the local authority will have a window within which they must come back to you and advise on next steps. So it's important that you know what those next steps are so that if necessary, you can escalate your concern if you're not satisfied that appropriate action is being taken. And we'll talk with you about that. There's no need to prepare anything in advance for this discussion. What we'll do is we'll work with you to sample some files and to understand how you secure any additional support for those children that need it. Now, you might be wondering what we mean by appropriate action. So just to explain that a little bit, if there has been a serious incident in your school, so for example, um, a child facing criminal proceedings due to serious violence on school sites, we'll want to know what preventative measures leaders have taken to avoid something as serious as that happening again. So what risk assessment is in place, any additional staff training, any additional supervision that might have been put in place for, the, for that child. In terms of allegations, if there is an allegation that's been made about a member of staff, we'll want to look at whether the school has followed the guidance that's set out in part four of keeping children safe in education. So in particular, uh, paragraphs 361 and 362 of that document state that when schools are dealing with allegations, they should be applying common sense and judgment. They should be dealing with allegations quickly, fairly, consistently, and providing effective protection for children, as well as supporting the person that's subject to the allegation. And the school should also be seeking advice from the local authority designated officer. And what we'll want to do is, is talk to you to understand if those actions were taken. In terms of talking to governors or trustees, so those who are legally responsible for the school, we'll want to know how they are ensuring and assuring that safeguarding is effective. So. What are they doing to ensure that appropriate safeguarding systems are in place to keep children safe? And how are they doing that strategic checking to assure themselves that those systems are working effectively? Now, during an inspection, we will ask leaders about how they recruit staff safely, and, and that will include looking at the single central record. Now, we use the single central record as a starting point for a much wider conversation about how leaders recruit staff and how they make sure that adults in school are safe to work with children. And sadly, we, we do know that from things that have happened over time, that sometimes predatory people do try to join the staff of schools. So the murders committed in Soham in 2002 and the resulting inquiry are illustrations of that. The checks that schools carry out, as I'm sure you know, are a really important safety mechanism for protecting children in schools from some very serious harm. Now, we do know that sometimes leaders are worried that our check of the single central record can feel quite high stakes, partly because we do it early on in the inspection process and partly because the guidance is so detailed in terms of the different checks that are needed depending on people's roles in school. So to reassure you, there is absolutely no secret Ofsted checklist for looking at the single central record. When we review this document, what we're doing is checking if a school is meeting the minimum recording requirements that are set out in keeping children safe in education. So currently in paragraphs 268 to 272. And as well as checking the single central record, when we're doing that, we may well ask about how the school manages recruitment more widely. So for example, how posts are advertised, who sits on appointment panels, the training they've had, and how new staff are inducted. We typically choose to check the single central record early on in an inspection, so that if there are any uh, minor administrative errors, that gives schools time to correct those before the end of the inspection. 
So it, it might be, given the size of some staff bodies and the changing population of some schools, that an odd check has been missed, such as a Section 128 check or a prohibition from teaching check. And things like that can be easily put right during an inspection. That said, while there are some isolated and more minor missing checks that can be quick to rectify, we will want to be absolutely certain that recruitment processes and the single central record are well managed and that staff are suitable to be working with children. Throughout an inspection, we'll take account of stakeholders' views. So we'll pay particular careful attention to evidence from staff, from pupils, speaking with parents and other partners, including any alternative provision that a school might be using. And what we'll do is test out what people tell us with what we see is happening on the ground. So we might ask pupils what they would do if they had a concern. We might talk to them about what they've learned about keeping themselves safe online and out in the community. And here we're thinking about how a school is, an, is enabling their pupils to understand risk and to act safely. When we talk with staff, we may well ask about their understanding of the signs of potential abuse and what they need to do if they have got a concern about a pupil or a member of staff. And we'll check that then against with what leaders have told us and with what the school's policy says. And through our discussions with both pupils and with staff, we may also explore different safeguarding themes such as child on child abuse, sexual harassment and violence, children missing in education and the prevent duty. Throughout, we'll focus on how effectively the school considers the needs of the most vulnerable children they have on their role. So we'll want to know about the ways in which leaders have made appropriate and effective safeguarding arrangements that reflect the additional vulnerabilities that pupils in their particular school may have. So as part of that, we'll look at um, what's happening for pupils with SEND, maybe pupils with a social worker, children who are looked after and pupils that attend any alternative provision. And in terms of alternative provision in particular, We'll explore whether the school has checked that the adults in the provider are safe to work with children. And we'll also consider whether leaders and staff keep in regular contact to check that those pupils are safe and learning well. As with all our inspection work, we'll triangulate what leaders are telling us, what we see is happening on the ground with what others are telling us as well, taking those stakeholders views into account proportionately. And often that will be done through a combination of formal and informal discussions, as well as considering the responses to the staff, the parent and the pupil surveys. If we're on inspection and staff or pupils or parents do raise concerns, then we'll discuss those with leaders. And what we might do as a result is broaden the number of pupils or staff that we speak with so that we can really check things out further. And as I've already said, we'll consider all of that alongside the first hand evidence that we're collecting during that inspection. And all those activities are designed really to give you the opportunity to share the culture of safeguarding that you've established in your school. And it's all set out in the handbook. So paragraph 370 of our current schools inspection handbook sets out there that inspectors will go beyond ensuring that schools are meeting their statutory requirements and beyond simply reviewing documents. We're going to be looking at the effectiveness of that safeguarding culture and triangulating the evidence that we're gathering during the inspection. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes now talking specifically about safeguarding for pupils with SEND and actually the messages that I'm going to share here may well be equally relevant to other vulnerable pupils that you have in your school. So pupils with a social worker, children looked after, for example. So we write about safeguarding pupils with SEND in paragraph 268 of our inspection handbook. And on inspection, as I've already said, we'll focus on how effectively the, the school is considering the needs of those most vulnerable children, which includes those pupils with SEND. And that's because we know that pupils with SEND often have significant and complex vulnerabilities, which mean that they can face additional safeguarding challenges. And it's important that leaders understand and preempt the increased risks that those pupils may be facing, for example, being drawn into harmful situations as a result of grooming, the increased likelihood that those pupils may experience abuse from other pupils or from adults, 
and that those peoples may have additional barriers in reporting any abuse that's happening to them and having that abuse recognised by professionals. So on inspection, we'll want to know about the ways in which leaders have made appropriate and effective safeguarding arrangements that reflect those additional vulnerabilities. We'll also explore the systems that leaders have in place to enable those children who might be non-verbal or who have communication difficulties to share any concerns and worries that they may have, and then how leaders and staff respond and act on those concerns. We'll consider how leaders are adapting any PSHE or RSHE, um, taking into account the child's age and stage of development. And finally, we'll also look at whether any use of reasonable force or restraint is in line with the guidance that's set out in keeping children safe in education. And by that, we'll be looking at if it's being used, is it being used safely and with the aim of reducing the need for physical intervention over time. And I'm sure you'll know that there's non-statutory guidance out there written by the DfE that, that is a useful document to refer to. So on to making the safeguarding judgment. When we make a judgment about safeguarding on inspection, we take into account all of those things that I've just outlined and how effectively those things come together to form an open and positive culture of safeguarding. And from that, we then make the binary judgment of whether safeguarding is effective or ineffective. And I think to be clear here, when we're looking at safeguarding, effective safeguarding is not necessarily perfect safeguarding. And if minor improvements are needed, we'll discuss those with you and we might include them in the final inspection report if that's appropriate. Safeguarding sits within our leadership and management judgment. And because of that, if safeguarding is ineffective, then it is likely to have an impact on the leadership and management judgment and the leadership and management judgment, therefore, is likely to be inadequate. So to bring all of that together and just to summarise where we've got to so far, we don't use a checklist to inspect safeguarding. What we look at isn't just about compliance. We're evaluating the overall culture of safeguarding in a school. Keeping children safe in education is our reference point for all matters, including when we're checking the single central record. Pupils with SEND and other vulnerable pupils can face additional safeguarding challenges, and we should all be alert to those. And during inspection, we'll explore how you're responding to those additional challenges within your school's context. Ultimately, as Lee said earlier, safeguarding is our collective responsibility. And if we find something that doesn't seem quite right during an inspection, we'll take time to explore that with you. And finally, as we've already said, we know that schools can't be everything to everyone. And in that spirit, inspectors will be proportionate and realistic about what's possible. Above all, we all want pupils to be safe and to be able to access any support that they might need. And I'm now going to hand over to Jonathan to talk about effective safeguarding. Thanks, Claire. Let's explore further what we mean by effective safeguarding. So our updated school inspection handbook, and that's a paragraph 367, it's pulled together and clarified our definition of safeguarding. Of course, that means we focus on an effective safeguarding culture. And this slide here captures some of the language that we use. And you can see that above all, we've emphasised the importance of schools adopting an open and positive culture. And also note on that slide the language around sharing information, serious harm, speaking out, and prompt and proportionate action. Now, the importance of sharing information is threaded throughout keeping children safe in education and for pupils to receive the right help at the right time, and that's paragraph 70 of keeping children safe in education. Effective action will include sharing information with the right agencies and doing this in what we capture in the handbook as a, in a timely manner. So examples would include sharing information through referrals or at points of transition when pupils move to different schools. Now, in terms of that word timeliness, a reminder that you'll be working to local thresholds regarding sharing concerns. So you should familiarize yourselves with these and know what's expected locally. So exactly what's meant by timely? Well, it's context specific. 
High risk will need an immediate response, but in other situations, it's right to monitor before making referrals. Now, leaders need to use their judgment, but the guiding principle is always what's best to keep the child safe. Now, in writing the updated definition, we've made use of research and work undertaken by other organisations with a similar focus on safeguarding. And that's helped us form this kind of further clarification about how we might go about se securing an effective culture. Now, in that work from those other organisations, it found that in settings with closed cultures, often people couldn't speak up for themselves or others. Staff were not always supported or encouraged to raise concerns, and managers often failed to engage or respond to recommendations from external agencies. And you know, more widely, staff were often poorly inducted and trained. So our definition emphasizes these aspects of practice and concludes by setting out the importance of schools being receptive to, to challenge and re reflecting carefully on their practice. Now, the rest of the definition continues to capture other aspects um, of what we might consider to be an open and positive culture. And it includes, and you'll recognise this, I'm sure, our well-established identify, help and manage framework. Now, it reminds us of the importance of having appropriate child protection arrangements that identify pupils who may need help, who are at risk of harm or have been harmed, and securing help and using experts, as we've said, in a timely way if required. And of course, not forgetting the importance of managing safer recruitment and any allegations about adults. Now, we found this to be a really helpful construct when thinking about how effectively those responsible for governance establish a culture of safeguarding the school. And hopefully you'll see the focus on culture rather than compliance of meeting statutory requirements is built into all that we've written. And this means that on inspection, inspectors delve into the impact of the policies and training that are in place. OK, on to what might constitute perhaps ineffective safeguarding. Our updated handbook also provides further clarification about what might constitute ineffective safeguarding. And the words on this slide here are taken from paragraph 384 in the inspection handbook. I'll just give you a moment to read down it. And not surprisingly, it's the opposite of all that I've described in terms of an open and positive culture. And just, just to reassure you again, as we said at the start, very few settings fall into this category. And as we said, uh, taking account of all inspections, it's less than 1%. But when a school does fall into this category, it's because there are widespread failures that give serious cause for concern. And inspectors never make this judgment lightly. It isn't because paperwork, perhaps, or, you know, a certain policy is out of date, that paperwork isn't, you know, I don't know, in order, because those things can be fixed quickly. We go further in our handbook to exemplify some examples that might contribute to serious concerns. You can find these uh, in paragraph 385, and we're going to consider them on the next slide. So this slide um, shows some examples, and obviously, as I've said, taken from our handbook. And they're, they're what might constitute an effective safeguard. And that's not an exhaustive list, of course, but the examples do make clear the severity and seriousness in terms of the risk to pupils. And remember, we don't come across these frequently. Now, we've already explored some of these areas, but it's important to say that ineffective safeguarding is often the result of a number of serious failures. And these failures can often include a, a lack of oversight from leaders and governors about safeguarding practices. As we've said, poor staff training, perhaps, which means people don't know what to do if they have a concern or insufficient checks on the safety of vulnerable children who are perhaps, as we said, attending alternative provision or simply missing from school. Issues within the single central record aren't normally a reason for judging safeguarding ineffective. That being said, issues with the single central record or with any records might be indicative of wider and more serious issues which may not be minor. And it's often the difference between something being done but not recorded or something not being done at all. I'm now gonna pass over to Anna to talk more about early monitoring inspections. Over to you, Anna. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I'm just gonna run through some of our new arrangements for early monitoring inspections so people are clear. So we said earlier, very few schools are judged to have ineffective safeguarding. So when we look at the proportion of schools that are judged to be inadequate for safeguarding alone, the figures are even smaller. So 
Our analysis shows that in only 0.1, 0.2 of inspections is safeguarding the only reason that school is inadequate. So that's 12 in the um, 21 to 22 academic year and only five schools in the academic year of 22 to 23 so far. Um, so where this is the case, we've introduced a new type of monitoring inspection so that we can return to those schools more quickly. And I'll just go through how that looks. So put simply, when safeguarding is the only reason a school is inadequate, we will normally return by the end of the term following the inspection. So if the school has been able to resolve the safeguarding concerns, it's likely to see the overall grade improve. We've published our arrangements in our monitoring handbook, so, so please do have a look there for more details, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through those now too. So these monitoring inspections broadly follow the processes used for other types of monitoring inspections, but they'll be sharply focused on whether the school's safeguarding arrangements are now effective. So if safeguarding is still ineffective, we'll say so in a report and the school will have furthering monitoring in line with our normal monitoring procedures for an, in an adequate school. If, however, safeguarding is now effective, we'll do what we call deem the inspection to be a graded inspection. We won't rerun all the activities for a full graded inspection. We'll focus on some key areas to establish whether the evidence we've collected at the last inspection is still valid. So, for example, we might conduct a learning walk in a subject that had a deep dive last time rather than rerun the whole thing. We might talk to some groups of pupils about behaviour. If inspectors find that the previous grade is still valid, we'll change the safeguarding, leadership and overall effectiveness grades, but the others will remain as they were. And if we find that the previous judgments are no longer accurate, a full standard ungraded inspection takes place instead. So as I said, this is only for those very few schools where safeguarding was the only reason for the school being inadequate. So have a look at the details in the monitoring handbook if that applies to you. And that brings us to some new terminology that should offer you further peace of mind, which is what we call minor improvements. I'll go through uh, some examples of what we mean by that. So we promised to explore those words, minor improvements, and this is something we've added a bit more clarity around in our handbook, and that's in paragraph 383. So we know that there are some situations where things aren't perfect, but where and, and where pupils are at not serious risk. So in this situation, we'll outline these areas in the inspection report, but still judge safeguarding to be effective overall. So as the slide says, these are areas that have little or no immediate impact on children, and they'll not be indicative of wider cultural issues. And we'll also want to be satisfied that the school can address these areas quickly. So we've put here, ideally before the end of inspection, but there might reasonably be a situation where leaders need a little bit longer, but we're satisfied that the school is taking steps to resolve the matter or matters. So for example, governors might be ratifying changes to a new policy or procedure or further training scheduled to strengthen a specific aspect of practice. Um, if we do judge safeguarding to be effective, but that some minor improvements are required, that won't necessarily stop the school being judged good or outstanding. That's because the overall culture hasn't been undermined and we're satisfied that there's capacity to deal with things swiftly. So uh, we've just got a few brief messages here on what we might constitute to be a minor improvement. So these are just examples. You know, they are only examples. It's not an exhaustive list, but I think it's probably helpful to just give you a sense of what these might be. So, for example, it might be uh, it might be clear that staff can tell us about steps they're taking to record safeguarding pupils, but these actions aren't fully reflected in records. We might come across a situation where a concern about a child has not been referred quickly enough to the local authority where it should have been, or it's not been referred at all. Importantly, we'd want to be quickly assured by the school of the preventative actions that they are now taking. Also, importantly, we'd want to assure ourselves that this was a one-off omission and not a sign of a more widespread issue in terms of securing help. So it wouldn't necessarily undermine the whole judgment around safeguarding. So finally, last example, we might find some gaps in the single, sec or sin single central record, which can be addressed quickly during the inspection. So I think that's over to Lee now to just go through some of the scenarios before we come right through to the end of summary and some questions from yourselves. Yeah, thank, thank you, Anna. Um, and as I said right at the start, we thought putting all of that in context would be useful through, through a few scenarios. So this is um, your opportunity to think like an inspector. And while you know, these aren't um, examples directly taken from any one individual school, they have been um, put together from our collective experience on the panel in terms of what we have found in the past, as I say, just to bring some of this to, to life. So 
Um, inevitably, I'm going to have to read you a fairly lengthy scenario, and some of my colleagues will do the same to give you different different um, perspectives. So if you could just listen to the scenario um, that I'm about to kind of share with you, and you might want to just jot down the important points to keep track of them in your head, and essentially asking yourself the question, do the arrangements for safeguarding in this school appear to be effective? And if not, why not? So the single central record in this school is overseen by a member of the admin team who has not received any specific support relating to the relevant statutory requirements. And they say that nobody makes any wider checks on the document or the work that they do. Prohibition from teaching checks haven't been done um, on any staff. And the admin officer says that there isn't a column for it in their, in their records. So they don't know that it has been done or oh, I didn't know that it had to be done. There are three new members of staff on the single central record for whom some checks have not been completed. And the admin officer says that they, um, and they're not sure whether leaders and governors know that they haven't been undertaken. But the safeguarding policy is up to date. It does reflect current statutory guidance. It names key safeguarding personnel in school, and it describes a very clear process for reporting and recording concerns. Staff have also received safeguarding training. They say they know how to recognise issues such as neglect or child on child abuse. They say that it wouldn't happen in their school because they have such lovely children and families. Pupils across the school say that they don't tell staff about concerns that they might have because they don't think that they'd be listened to. And teachers know how to report concerns to the um, designated safeguarding lead and they say that sometimes they don't do that um, if they think that the issue is not serious enough. We just keep an eye on it is a familiar phrase that the inspector hears. And when they check some safeguarding records they find that they're relatively sparse. Some incidents do not appear to include the range of actions that leaders have taken to secure help and this makes it difficult for leaders to see any emerging patterns of concern. There are several instances where referrals should have been made to the local authority, but that not that doesn't that hasn't happened. Leaders are not sure what, if any, action has been taken in response to an individual case. So leaders haven't followed up concerns about persistent absence either. I think that includes several vulnerable looked after children, and they haven't followed up with the tenacity that is needed to assure themselves that pupils are safe. So leaders are not keeping oversight of children on their role who attend any unregistered and unmonitored alternative provision. They don't check the safeguarding arrangements in the AP that they use. Now, that was relatively lengthy, but if you've been keeping a note um, in your mind, hopefully what you found is that this scenario, although there are positives within it, does paint a worrying picture. There are some serious and widespread concerns, for example, did you pick up on recruitment checks on staff joining the school are viewed or appear to be viewed as an admin task rather than an assurance about the suitability of adults to work with children? There are some serious omissions there and a certainly a lack of a lack of oversight. And although the policies are up to date and staff have had some training, they don't appear to be acting on it. You know, staff don't appear to think that it could happen here. And the school's safeguarding records are an indication of this. You know, the records do not include the range of actions that leaders have taken, uh, or um, it doesn't appear that some concerns have been um, passed to the, to the local authority. And keeping children safe in education, as I think Jonathan mentioned earlier, does have a, a dedicated section on record keeping. That's um, paragraph 68. It, it makes clear that records should be clear and comprehensive. They should detail how the concern was followed up and resolved, and they should know actions and decisions reached as well as the outcome. And finally, leaders are not alert in this school to the potential risk of vulnerable children not being in school. They haven't checked that they are safe. And for those in the AP, it appears to be out of sight, out of mind. So in summary, there are some serious widespread concerns in this scenario. Most vulnerable children aren't being adequately protected. Concerns about children that meet a threshold for potential significant harm aren't being passed on. And pupils across the school say that adults don't act upon their concerns when they share them. It's therefore likely that in this scenario, the safeguarding arrangements are judged to be ineffective. And in this instance, the next step may well be around ensuring that statutory checks are fully completed and prompt action is taken where concerns about people's welfare are identified. 
So leaders oversight of safeguarding is also likely to be an identified next step. So Claire, I think, is going to take us through another scenario. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Lee. Um, so as you've just done, um, we'd like you to consider in this scenario if arrangements for safeguarding appear to be effective or not. And in the same way that, that Lee's just said, if you want to take some notes as we go through to sort of help draw your attention to the key points. So in this school, um, inspectors find that the single central record is well organised and it includes all the checks that leaders are required to make. However, there are a couple of checks where the date isn't listed. And also, for two new members of staff, no Section 128 checks have been made, but they have been made for other leaders and trustees. The safeguarding and child protection policy on the school website is out of date, and it lists the former head teacher as the designated safeguarding lead even though that head teacher left the school at the end of the previous term. The policy has been produced by the Multi-Academy Trust and it's quite generic and there are several spaces where it says insert name of school here. Documents on the school website suggest that arrangements for RSE are appropriate and pupils learn about healthy relationships in an age appropriate way in line with what's set out in the policy. When inspectors review case files, there is an isolated example of a concern not being referred that appears to meet local authority thresholds. In this instance, leaders were quick to take preventative measures in response to the concern and the pupil is safe and staff are receptive to discussions about thresholds and what might constitute harm. The designated safeguarding lead understands their role. They've had recent training, which has helped them to identify aspects of the school safeguarding practice that could be improved. And they have begun working with the new head teacher to plan how those, those improvements will be made. All of the staff in the school have completed online safeguarding training. Some are more confident than others in applying that training to the school's context, but everyone knows what to do if they've got a concern about a child and who to tell. Members of the Board of Trustees also have sufficient knowledge about safeguarding. Across the school, staff are kind to pupils and pupils report being happy. Most pupils are adamant that there's no bullying because they're taught to be inclusive and considerate. However, some groups of pupils in year seven and eight identified a number of concerns relating to bullying at the start of the academic year. Leaders were alert to those concerns and took action to keep people safe and to reassure pupils. The school has had periods of time without a head teacher or a safeguarding governor due to long-term illness over the last year. A new head teacher and safeguarding governor have been appointed recently, and they're both knowledgeable and have an accurate view of the changes that need to be made. So in this scenario, safeguarding is likely to be judged effective. And that's because those currently leading the school safeguarding work are knowledgeable and well-trained, and they've already taken steps to strengthen aspects of safeguarding practice that they feel aren't as strong as they could be. Although there were those two section 128 checks that hadn't been done, all other checks are in place, and that error can be put right quickly. Most of the pupils in the school described a positive culture and were, were safe and happy. And where concerns did emerge in that school, leaders' actions were appropriate and timely. Where there was an anomaly in terms of the referral, that had been acted on appropriately. In this school, there are some minor shortcomings around oversight and assurance, but those don't undermine the overall culture of safeguarding. However, it is likely that in this scenario, inspectors will highlight some minor improvements that can be made in relation to statutory checks and oversight of key policies. We hope that you found those two scenarios helpful, and I'm now going to hand over to Jonathan just to talk you through some other examples. 
Thanks, Claire. As Claire said, let's let's run through uh, a few more examples that can occasionally come up when we explore safeguarding arrangements. And some of these examples also featured in the questions that were shared in advance of the webinar. So we're often asked about survey responses and how these are managed. Well, responses can sometimes set out concerns from different groups, but inspectors are trained to deal with any concerns in a proportionate way and think, as we've said, big picture and it might be that the responses are perhaps isolated to a certain group that leaders are aware as Claire's just said in her, her example her scenario and that leaders are ultimately doing all they can so the inspectors would therefore prioritize speaking to more parents and pupils and may need to explore matters further with leaders to understand the nature of the concerns and it's highly unlikely that issues such as this in and of themselves would lead to a certain judgment Inspectors will simply talk to more people and get a rounded picture. Now have a look at the scenario on the slide here. So, so when walking around the school site, parts of it are unsafe. Pupils are cutting through an area currently being refurbished. Well, this is a health and safety concern, but it does not necessarily fall within our overall considerations of arrangements for safeguarding. Inspectors would want to understand how any potentially unsafe areas in school are managed and supervised. And it might be that leaders need to take some perhaps, you know, swift remedial action, but it's not indicative of wider approaches to managing risk. Either way, inspectors would work with you to put this right. And we just simply want to be reassured that any potential risk to pupils' health are well managed and there aren't any concerns. On to staff training. So an example here where training schedules show that some staff have not attended safeguarding update training or they haven't signed to say they've read part one of keeping children safe in education. Now, it's worth saying at this point that Ofsted has no specific expectations about how safeguarding training is recorded. And of course, it could maybe well be useful, you know, to keep a record of what staff have attended and what they've done so that you can be assured colleagues have the most up to date messages. But the key duty here is to ensure that staff are suitably trained and can carry out their safeguarding work effectively. A list on its own doesn't prove or disprove that this is the case. So to get beneath the surface of leaders' approach to safeguarding, inspectors might ask leaders how they check that staff understand the contents of keeping children safe in education. And of course, how they check the impact of safeguarding training in the round. And a final example from me, so thresholds and concerns. So when reviewing safeguarding case files, there was an isolated example of leaders not referring a concern onto the local authority, even though it appeared to meet thresholds, but leaders acted quickly. There were you know, useful professional discussions where they reflected and ultimately the pupil was safe. Now, we explored and touched upon this, of course, in one of our scenarios, but this does not mean that safeguarding arrangements are immediately ineffective. The leaders appear to be making the right decision in all other respects, and this is an anomaly. If preventative measures are taken to ensure the people is safe and that the need to refer won't be overlooked in the future, of course, we might have no further cause for concern. I do hope you found those uh, scenarios, those shorter scenarios, helpful. Over to Anna to start wrapping things up for us. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. And I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll just give a quick summary of updates and then we'll open to questions. So just in terms of summaries to the handbook in particular. So we've updated our safeguarding definition, highlighting that a culture of safeguarding should be seen as open and positive. We've given some additional information about what that might look like in a school. And we've also clarified that effective safeguarding is not perfect safeguarding. So where there are minor improvements, we'll consider these with you. And it may be that they're an area, area for improvement and that that's identified around this. But the school could still be good or better. We've committed to revisiting schools more quickly where safeguarding is the only reason where school, uh, why the school was judged to be inadequate. And if the school's been able to resolve the safeguarding concerns, it's likely to see its overall grade improve. And then a final word on reporting. Where safeguarding is effective, we will say so in a statement that essentially says safeguarding is effective, but we will not routinely write any more about this. So this is because we do not want schools to feel that they have to do anything different based on what they might read in another's report. So this could add to workload when what they are doing is already working well. Where safeguarding is ineffective, we will make this clear through the report. And where safeguarding is ineffective, we will write about it, making it clear to parents what the issues are right from the start of the report. And don't forget, we've also added clarity around who you can share the inspection outcome with. So 
Leaders may share the inspection outcome and findings in confidence with whoever they deem appropriate, including others not involved in the school, provided the information is not made public or shared with parents. So just a reminder within that, grades are provisional and they're subject to quality assurance and moderation, just to bear that in mind. And then finally, well, um, oh, hang on, I'm just going to pop through. Yeah, so takeaway points. Basically, if we think about safeguarding, the way in which we look at it in the our lens, safeguarding is more about compliance with statutory requirements. It's about how everyone works together to develop an open and positive culture where everyone feels safe and is well cared for. So we ask about safeguarding throughout many inspection activities. Where safeguarding is judged to be ineffective, it's unlikely to be because of a single issue unless it's a very serious one. Often, it's a combination of numerous weaknesses that collectively put pupils at risk, and we've given you some examples of those. Safeguarding is a binary judgment, so it's either effective or ineffective. So sometimes safeguarding can be effective even when some improvements have been identified to exist. The deciding factor for those is whether the issues are serious or widespread. If they are, simply, safeguarding is ineffective. If they're not, it's effective, but there might be next steps for leaders to address. So the capacity of leaders to act on any concerns is also key in this. And then lastly, while we've made some updates to our handbook, expectations of how we all work to keep children safe are the same. So we know you're very busy, you've got wide ranging responsibilities. As we've said, leaders aren't social workers and they can't be everything to everyone. So we'll work with you if there are minor improvements that can be put right and ineffective judgments are very rare and are only ever made because the risks to pupils are widespread and serious. So I can see some questions have come in and thank you ever so much for attending the webinar. If you are able to hang on a little, we'll come to some of the questions first, you know, ones that have been submitted before this webinar, but also ones that have come through during this session. Um, now, I think I've actually seen this in a few different places and I think this is the point where we can come off uh, well, we can come onto camera, I should say, and um, we can start directing some of our questions across. So I can see Lee, I can see Jonathan, and hopefully I'll see Claire in just a moment. Hello. Um, so the first question, and Lee, this won't be a surprise, I think this came through for our last webinar as well, but it was particularly around filtering and monitoring, um, both in terms of how we look at that on inspection. We've also had a question around some of the training for our inspectors, and I'll hit that off quickly and hand over to you on the filtering monitoring. So we work closely with the UK Safer Internet Centre. We've got an ongoing um, work that we do with them, and they kind of continue to make sure that our inspector expertise is absolutely where it should be. Lee, shall I hand over to you for how it looks on inspection? Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose the first thing to say is that inspectors won't be going and checking your systems themselves. Essentially, it will be a discussion. I can't remember which of my colleagues mentioned this earlier, but it's about how do you ensure that you have the right filtering and monitoring in place? And then who does the assurance that that's actually um, what's happening in practice? So it's a question essentially for leaders, for governors. You know, what is it that you've done? How have you ensured that that's in place? but also the question and who's assuring that actually what you've said should be in place is actually in place. So it's not for inspectors to go off and do, you know, the, the checking of the, of the hardware themselves. It is essentially a leadership and management um, conversation. Um, thank you. Jonathan, did you want to come in on that at all or are we all good? I've got, I've, there's got a few in fairness, I should probably get to. Right, fab. Okay, so the second one I'm going to come to, um, and Jonathan, I'm going to uh, head this your way, I think, particularly given, um, your sense of being out as a school inspector. So to what extent can the views of a small number of people influence the report outcome? So how do you ensure a parent's report? And we've had a similar question that's come through in terms of what if you get a few parental complaints about particular issues? So would you mind just coming in on that one in terms of triangulation? Yeah, thanks, Anna. And it's, it is a common question. I guess we've used this, this word a lot, and I'll use it again in this response, and to reassure you all, everybody, it's very, very rare that that would suddenly present an immediate uh, concern for us. Simply what inspectors would do is talk to more pupils or talk to more parents, and ultimately make sure they involve leaders as they go along as well. So as, as Anna said there, everybody, we would be triangulating things. So, so please don't worry if something crops up. It often Often does um, because people are sharing their views on inspection but we'll simply spread the net if we need to a little more widely thank you um lee claire anything you wanted to pop into that one no oh. i think it, it's it's about seeing the big picture isn't it and mm. that um, you know when we when we rightly gather the views of 
you know, pupils and staff and parents you know it's it's about people you know everybody's perception of of let's say an event or an incident but essentially mm. them just want to go and test that out because mm. even if for example a pupil so has said that they have raised an issue and they don't feel that leaders have done anything about it that doesn't mean when we speak to leaders that they haven't done anything about it because i'm sure leaders is often the case well then say well actually we've done x y and z and the people is just not aware or the people might be aware but it just hasn't been resolved to their satisfaction mm. so it's building on jonathan's answer there which is absolutely the right one it's about seeing the big picture and as we said earlier there is no one single piece of evidence that will ever lead to an ultimate judgment, whether that's safeguarding or, or any other aspect of, um, of our inspection framework, is about building an evidence base and the strength of evidence um, rather mm. than you know, an individual um, conversation, discussion, whatever it might be. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a really helpful one there. Um, um, another quick question around who and how should be who should be on the single sector record. Now we've gone through that a little. I'd really recommend that people look at the DFE webinar on on exactly how that's set out. I can see lots of nods. That's you know we refer our inspectors to that point. It's keeping children safe in education where that's listed out. But those webinars are very useful, so um, they are easily Googleable if needs be. But um, but those are very helpful. Now just in terms of a question that's come through you know the Ofsted review of sexual abuse in in schools and colleges there's the question here that is around yeah you know, how have we changed how we inspect schools based on that um that piece of work Lee did you want to kick off on this one I'm happy to come in too yeah I mean, I mean I think we can all contribute I think we've uh, obviously put that report raised awareness not only mm. across the sector but also within our own workforce so I think it will naturally be in inspectors minds in any way we added specific references to our handbook. And of course, where we need to, we've also introduced that inspectors can speak to single sex groups because that might mm. be a forum where some of those discussions can happen in a more um, comfortable or, or appropriate way. That's not to say every inspection, there will be discussions with you know, single sex groups, only where that may be needed in terms of getting underneath um, a little bit further, something that, that, that might have kind of cropped up. Um, so it is part and parcel, but um, there'll not be, there'll not be anything specific that you can identify yeah. because we've we've essentially woven it through the work that we already do. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. So a couple of questions around special educational needs children. How can we make sure for them, particularly if they're non-verbal, if there are additional needs that inhibit their ability to fully engage with um, send staff? How do we make sure that we essentially gather their views or know that leaders are in the best way possible? Yeah, I'm happy to pick that up, Anna. I mean, ju ju just to say, first of all, that of course, inspectors have, uh, you know, a widespread training on on exactly, you know, those issues and everything we've explored today. Um, but just to say to you as, as school leaders or people working in school, you know, if that is the case, um, we, we will adjust things and listen to you carefully. So do do feel free. Um, if it's helpful for pupils to bring along a, you know, a, a known adult to them to any conversations so that they can feel kind of supported through through that process. Or indeed, you know, if it's not appropriate for us to be speaking to specific pupils, you can let us know off and say that at the start of, you know, inspections, some pupils don't, you know, don't feel comfortable, um, you know, talking to strangers. But if they do and they want to bring someone along with them, an adult they perhaps work with frequently, that's absolutely fine. Cool. Well, thank you. I think that's probably about the time where we're done for now. So we, we're just a few minutes over, but hopefully that's been helpful to all that have been here. And, and um, any questions that we haven't got, we'll make sure that that's you know reflected in further engagement. Lee, I'll hand over to you to wrap up. No, thank you. And can I just thank everybody, um, not only those that have presented from, from the team, but also um, for all of you that have dialed in um, tonight to, to listen. As we've said throughout, the slides will be available shortly on YouTube. So you can direct colleagues who perhaps couldn't make this evening um, to, to the recording. And of course, there is a raft of other resources that we've mentioned that we'll try and flag and, and um, reference to you so you can easily, easily find them. Um, so all that's left for me to say is, is thank you. Um, look out for other webinars that we have in the pipeline. There are, um, there are webinars around attendance, behaviour and alternative provision in the pipeline for this term. So look out for those. And of course, we're always eager to hear if there are any other topics that you would want to hear um, um, you know, about Ofsted from Ofsted. Um, so thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>